It's July 31st, 2015. It's about 11.30 p.m. It's a Friday. Um, and four people are on a conference call from across the country. And what these people have in common is they are exhausted, and they're dedicated, they are under a lot of stress, but they're also professionals. And they're responsible collectively to launch the largest update to the US Chess Organization's website in about a decade. And they have to do it tonight. Dev is go, I say. Now, let me explain, let me back up and explain. There's a few more people in the room um, uh, on the conference call participating. There are family members, there are people that have been feeding us this, this week. There are people that are putting up with our uh, work obligations, our antisocial work obligations tonight. Um, and they're along for the ride and, and, and sort of helping take care of us. And, and this is what you would see if you were one of them. Dev is a go, I say. As the lead developer on the project, uh, I am basically affirming that the developer team affirms that this code is ready. Um, and because I'm also the um, project manager on the project, um, I am uh, running this meeting. And so I say, sysops, go or no go for launch. Matt Pearson is in Seattle, Washington. He's on the conference call. Uh, SysOps is go for launch, he says. Um, if he had any reservations about the servers not being ready for what we're about to do, uh, if he thought there was anything more we could do to prepare, he would say SysOps is a no-go for launch. But we got a thumbs up from SysOps. <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was supposed to autoplay. <coughs> uh, QA, go or no-go for launch. QA is go, says Catherine. Catherine's our newest developer. She's in training with us. She's also responsible for QA. Um, she is um, basically affirming that, yeah, the QA team is, is, is affirming that all tests are passing. Um, and finally, I say uh, IT operations, go or no go for launch. Mike Nolan is a, a member of the staff of the US Chess uh, Federation. Uh, and he's chuckling as he says, Sys, uh, IT is go for launch. He's never experienced this before. And what he may or may not realize, I think he gets it, but what he may not realize is just how seriously we're taking this, um, even as we're going down this checklist. Um, and I'll, I'll get back to why we're taking it so seriously later on. But for now, um, I want to explain uh, for, for, for now, I just want to say at Rocketlift, we enjoy our space metaphors, so we're doing the mission control thing. All systems are go for launch, I say. So let's hit the red button. And I enqueue the final countdown. That's where the Joe Bluth slide comes in, right? So we're, we're listening to this. As uh, Matt Pearson uh, types some keys and clicks some buttons on his terminal and his, and his panel, uh, and he reports that he's seeing server traffic spike on our Nginx proxy server, which means that uh, things should be uh, working. Um, so we all start frantically refreshing, refreshing, <laughs> refreshing. This is totally not auto-playing the way it's supposed to, but we'll, we'll deal. So we're refreshing. We're refreshing. Is it going to work? We're waiting for caches to clear <laughs> on the internets. We're still refreshing. And voila, it launches. Sorry, the auto-play was supposed to make that a lot faster. <laughs> but that's kind of what it felt like. <laughs> and so these four people on the conference call are reaching for their glasses of scotch, are celebrating, are clicking around the site, uh, and, and let me show you a, a little of what uh, that looks like. There's this handy pop-up, which the client wanted. We've got uh, this nice, beautiful 
uh, vibrant homepage. This is a local version, so it's not per it's not completely uh, accurate. But we've got a beautiful layout, very smooth, um, very clean, very minimal, if you will. Lots of different content. It's really putting forward uh, the the big front and center news items on the homepage, the latest blog posts. Um, they manage a lot of digital content that's really fantastic, and their their old website doesn't um, show it off at all. So we've got a magazine. Uh, and then another for kids. We've got links to, to ratings for, for chess players. We've got our sponsors. And then there's this subtle former uschess.org link here, which points back to the old homepage, which is still live. That's intentional. There's a lot of content on this old site that uh, is, uh, has not been migrated yet at this point in time. We're just launching this, this first page uh, or, or handful of pages. Um, the about page, which I'm not going to look at right now, it tells the story of the organization as a 501c3. That was a big, important goal of theirs. The give pages explain some of the donation campaigns. Whoops, there's a bug. And yeah, that's live. And we just introduced that bug in the last week, and we'll come back to that. Um, the donate button takes you to where you can actually give online. Uh, this is all brand new. They haven't had this kind of capability on their website previously. So we're all uh, happily refreshing, sipping our scotch, slapping backs, saying hurrah. And um, then all of a sudden, we start seeing this happen. <laughs> this is all in the course of about five, five minutes at the most. And so <clears throat> my promise is in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to be candid with you uh, about a behind the scenes look at, at how we developed this project, how we approached it every step of the way. I'm um, going to be honest to the point that I'm a little scared about some of the things I'm going to admit about some mistakes we've made. Um, and I promise to tell you the end of the story and how we fixed it. But first, we're going to go way back to a year ago um, when we started this project, um, the very beginning, the sales process. We heard that this organization was in need of a website, so we begin this cautious sales process. They're getting to know us, we're getting to know them. Uh, everybody's kind of scared that they might be wasting their time or they might be losing out, might, might be made to look the fool. They're trying to be cautious. We're trying to be cautious but not seem too cautious. Uh, we want to be fun and eager but not too eager. Uh, we just want to play it cool. What we need in a sales process is, uh, honestly, autoplay, come on. What we need in a sales process is to, to find great projects that aren't going to ruin us. Uh, good fits where we can provide a win-win for our clients. Uh, we want to protect ourselves from overcommitment. Uh, we want to make sure that we're actually able to do good work for them. Um, and only when we're convinced that it's a win-win do we want to actually pursue things. So we're actually, in the beginning, we're looking for reasons why this isn't a good fit. We don't find any, so we keep escalating it in the sales process. Um, then there's an RFP process. Now, out, out of uh, this is request for proposals, right? So this is a traditional organizations put these things together where they describe what they think they're looking for. Uh, that's a key phrase. Um, and out of respect for this particular organization, I don't want to get too specific here, but I will say that in general, RFPs suck. Um, <laughs> they are what they think they need. They're always wrong because they haven't gone through a proper discovery process. They can't possibly because they need your expertise as the agency in order to find out what they truly need. Um, but I think people uh, still do RFPs because it's the way things are done. There's sort of momentum. It's what people understand. Um, and so we only go after RFPs when we believe we've got a strong leg up, when we uh, have an opportunity to consult with them and the, the writing of the RFP, which was the case uh, in this particular project. We pursued that because they came to us and said, we're, we're putting an RFP together, but we're starting the conversations. And that's like Yahtzee, because we can help inform what their RFP is going to say. Um, but on the positive side of an RFP, a, a way to look at it constructively from our side of the table is that it's really it's a tool that they're using to you know go through a process to get an outcome for them. Um, you have a, a large organization a lot of politics, inevitably, and even in healthy organizations, um, which this is. These are guys that are great, great to work with. Um, and you have people basically um, needing to get buy-in from all the stakeholders. I wanted to have a slide of a guy holding, a waiter holding steak, like stakeholders, um, but I lost it. Um, and so we went through this RFP process. And what we're trying to... I, 
identify is their wants versus their needs. Um, but on the fun side of things, once you are able to actually um, you know, get somewhere in the sales process, having some conversations. We're not talking about closing a deal, we're talking about having conversations. You're building trust, you're working together. Um, if indeed there's a win-win, you can celebrate that uh, and, and take that momentum forward, take that energy forward. Trust is high, there never may be a more positive time in the relationship. Usually there, there will be, and, and, and happy engagements, there will be other great times, but that's one of the best times. Everybody's excited to get started. So we try to use that to, to move forward. Um, <clears throat> so what, what they need is, uh, when, when we're talking with them about this, the, the last thing we wanna do is start talking about solutions. They come to us with uh, 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 what they think is a need. They say, we, we, th we need a new website. We think we need WordPress, okay? Let's not talk about that yet. Yeah, we do WordPress agencies, but let's like really, in or WordPress websites, but let's really talk about what you actually need here. Um, they, they don't need WordPress. WordPress is just a means to an end. Um, they may not even need a website some of the time. Obviously in this project they did, um, but it's far better to say what you need is a strategy for communicating your, um, your, your message and accomplishing your goals. And, and them, those aren't just words. Um, the website really is just the tool to accomplish that and we need to put it in the context of, of a solution for them that has a lot wider ranging complications than just how your website's gonna work. The website then needs to be built and designed in that context uh, so that it can, it can work as a part of a larger system. I used to have a pretty shallow understanding of wants versus needs. I, I used to think, you know, so I want a cupcake, but I really, I need celery sticks with peanut butter. And uh, it's not really, it's a little condescending, like, oh, the client says they want these things, but I know that they really need these things. I used to think about it that way. Now I think that what you want helps identify what you need, which eventually gets you to what you want. So they wanted to tell their story and in a new website, that's what they articulated. They needed a new identity for the organization. Um, in order to effectively tell that story, that became really clear through our sales process, that we just don't need, a, you don't just need a new website, you need a new logo, uh, you need a new color scheme, and that's going to be something you use on your business cards and your print publications on, on everything. And so we, we really need to like help you find that solution before we just build you a website. The ones they articulated were a new look that modernized things, a, a different CMS, they were using another one, doesn't matter what it is, it was really a really old, outdated version of, a, of, a, of Joomla. Um, and uh, what we found there needs to be for this project were telling the nonprofit story, that was front and center. Um, and that was kind of a political need more than anything else. Uh, the, the board of directors wanted that, and that happens a lot with nonprofits. They think that they're, you know, the latest news with a nonprofit is really important to everybody, which may not be true, but that was something that was articulated as the people that are signing off on this and are evaluating success, they care about that a lot. And, and it's good, it's important because it's gonna help them fundraise more effectively. I don't mean to discount it, but it happened to be the most important priority on this project. Um, and so it became first, it was the very first thing to do in a long list of things that they wanted to do. Um, they wanted the ability to publish beautiful content. They realized that they were producing great copy, they had some great photos, I mean, there really are a, a factory of really amazing content and, and we were lucky to get to work with them because we most of the time we're trying to explain to clients uh, that you, you really need to think about content and no, they, they had that all figured out. They just needed a better showcase for it. Um, they needed to accommodate a lot of unique types of data. Um, my favorite thing about working for US Chess is that they have a database of every chess move in every chess game and every rated chess tournament for rated players. Uh, we're talking, they have 80,000 active dues paying members annually. Um, they have this just massive database, massive data. Um, and uh, so that exists in their old system. What are they gonna do with it? Um, there are other applications besides their CMS that need to be modernized, many of them custom. Uh, so again, there's that whole, they said, we need a new website. Well, what does that really mean? You need all these separate layers to what makes your apparent website work together. Um, and they needed to migrate their old content into whatever we came up with. And that's a way easier said than done. That meant, um, it's time to pose for the camera. Okay. <laughs> 
um, it meant auditing the content they had, identifying how it was and wasn't serving their needs. It meant writing new stuff and actually moving things from one platform to another. Turns out that's really deceptively complicated because it's not just copy and paste, it's formatting and a brand new layout. That's what we're discovering in the last few weeks. Is, is sort of, we didn't quite prep them well enough for that part of it. And they needed to modernize their hosting. They're on a, a, an old uh, internet service provider, um, which was, you know, uh, appropriate and, and sort of standard about 10 years ago, I think. Uh, but now, uh, with these kinds of web applications, you, you really need to be on a dedicated host. And that's, I laugh saying that because it's almost obvious, but they're on this painfully slow, uh, painfully bad service host just because they're in the business of providing telecom services and they just happen to run servers that help them do that and they upsell those. So we needed to modernize their hosting and move them. And that was no simple feat. Uh, in fact, that's not even, we haven't even started that yet. Um, because it is, it's insanely complicated because of the applications that they're running that they need to support. This is their new identity. Um, and uh, we think it's pretty cool. We partnered with uh, an organization in Seattle called Trey Creative. They're a design firm. Uh, Rocketlift, uh, we are great developers. Uh, we're pretty good at strategy systems thinking, but not so much strategy when it comes to marketing. We're really good, we think, at marketing uh, execution, so ongoing, drive leads, make sure that the right kind of leads, optimize your conversions, we're, we're good at that. Um, and we're, uh, I mentioned development. Um, we're, we're not great at designers, we're getting better at that as we grow, we hire uh, designers for projects on a project by project basis, but, but Trey Creative is a firm that's kind of the mirror of us uh, in, a lot of, in terms of strengths and weaknesses. They are great at design, great at strategy, great at identity work. Um, and they would rather be building sites and then moving on to the next project. We would rather be building a site and, and continuing to building it because it's complicated and we want to keep making it better and better and better. So we partnered with them. Uh, long story short, they put this together, but that's jumping ahead. Let's talk about the proposal process. Um, we were thinking, sure, WordPress looks like a good anchor piece for your solution, so let's move ahead with that. We're gonna team up with these folks called Trey Creative. Um, we're going to roughly define a phase one of work, which was something they actually wanted in, in the RFP because we suggested that it be in the RFP, to scope it to tell that in the nonprofit organization's story, um, create a new home page and some sample content that goes with it. Um, and then uh, and then we would would identify future phases in the in the roadmap. Um, so there's lots and lots and lots of things that we pushed out into the future. The, the tiniest bit of what we've discussed with them is what we've actually built out and launched. Um, there was a phase 1A, 1B uh, split. When it became clear that what we had originally scoped for phase 1A wasn't going to make their, their hard and fast July 31st deadline, we'll come back to that. Um, so it was kind of a negotiation and prioritization process, um, which is another way to bring out the difference between wants and needs. The organization's needs uh, Will, will be the, the things that, get, that don't get cut when we have to push things out into the future in order to make a deadline. This autoplay is a bummer, sorry about that. <clears throat> so uh, this is no surprise, because you know that we got the, the project, so we were finals, and then we were selected in this proposal process. Um, each point of the process included lots of discussion with new people, uh, sort of we were vetted and vetted by a committee and then vetted by the board, um, and there were, were one or two people that were tasked with um, with making this happen, and once they sort of identified that they liked us, then it was sort of our job to help ease their path, those individual peoples, to internally sell us to their organization. So that's what we're thinking of in terms of the sales process. Um, you have a shot if you can help solve somebody's problem, and the problem is that they don't, they haven't hired you yet. That's kind of the orientation that we had. <coughs> um, so selling internally. This is a terrible chess pun. Uh, we got the job, they sent us the first check, we got started. Um, so what does getting started mean? This discovery process. Um, we're asking a lot of questions, we're uncovering a lot of critical details that we didn't have time for in the sales process, because now we're doing the work, so now we're asking the questions we get to ask. Uh, we've got a lot of their time, they got a lot of our time. We want to truly understand their needs beyond what we just said. And, and we're fully expecting that even what we define in the proposal is going to be wrong. It's sort of a working draft, a living draft. We're going to move forward with uh, 
asking questions that are implied by that proposal to find out if some assumptions were correct. And a lot of them are gonna be incorrect and we're gonna come up with better ideas. Um, we're gonna look at their current processes. We're gonna look at their pain points. We're gonna identify who's involved in the current website, who should be involved, but is, is kept out because of its system. What can starting from scratch with a brand new CMS do for you that you, you can't get with your current system? Uh, forget what WordPress can, can do, because really we can make it do anything. Uh, what do you want it to do? And, um, and then clarifying objectives and desired outcomes. There, there are th things that were happening months after the proposal was accepted uh, where they were still uh, articulating needs that were like really critically important. Uh, and I you know, wish we would have learned about them sooner, but that's just the way it goes. That happens all the time, because people have different ideas about what's obvious. Eventually, we would produce through this discovery process how success will be measured, uh, so some really clear outcomes, um, clear expectations for how the project is gonna work, timelines, budgets, communication plan, and so on. Um, so now we have a, a mess to sit with, a whole lot of information that we've gathered. A good friend of mine uh, named Amy Schwab, uh, I've always remembered her saying this a, a long time ago, at this phase of a process, you just have to sit with a mess. Um, there, you've got all this information, nothing's in focus, it's really hard to see what's, what's next, but eventually, um, eventually clarity comes. And, and to be honest, this is an area where we really didn't handle it very well, um, mainly because it was sort of information overload for us. We're just sort of reading all these documents for, for days and days and then weeks and weeks, and it honestly it reminds me of the way that I wrote my senior thesis in college, which was not, I just read and kept reading and thought, oh, that'd be cool, that'd be cool, that'd be cool. And the week before it was due, it was like, oh, I should have been writing along the way. <laughs> so that was a big lesson learned for us on this, on this project. And it, it really continued, this continued to hurt us for, are you done with the slide? Should I move on? This continued to hurt us for um, like months because we, we had all this information that was, that was stuck in half it written Google documents that weren't authoritative um, like a lot of information was locked up in my head as the PM. Um, and, and so we'll get to kind of where we came out of that. Sorry. I wanted to say um, that really Trade Creative kind of saved us from this process. They had a, a very focused, like, well, here's what we need to do to move forward with design. All of these technical questions were asking about things like server requirements for their legacy applications, which, you know, hopefully they have staff that know the answers to. That's not important to just building the design. So let's move forward with the design. Um, and, and now I want to show you um, how we actually organize this uh, in Asana. And I think I'm going to stop mirroring. So I got a lot of questions when I did my talk uh, two years ago on checklists and mentioned Asana uh, about, like, show us Asana. We want to we wanna see that. So I wanted to actually go into kind of and make this a little more concrete. Um, so this is uh, a live view of our Asana roadmap for this project. We're running the project on a Scrum basis. Um, if you're not familiar with it, the sort of 30 second version is uh, uh, pick one thing to focus on and have your whole team focus on it and focus as tightly as you can so that you're not multitasking because we don't multitask well. Um, and that provides a constant uh, need to focus on what's, what's absolutely the most important thing to be doing next. Um, which, which, so you're constantly having that needs versus wants discussion. Um, also, uh, you're never projecting out further than a couple of weeks in terms of what you're gonna get done because you're minding the day-to-day -day momentum of the team in terms of what you're accomplishing. And uh, that allows you to make much better uh, informed predictions about uh, deadlines you're going to make or not gonna make than you would be able to do otherwise. Um, this is our phase 1A roadmap. I wanted to focus in on just an example of how we organize this. These are epics, which are groups of associated tasks, but we don't actually call, I'm going to step into this and go full screen on the global header. So this is just that component of the website that is at the very top of the page, this right here, um, the menu uh, and up. Um, so there's these stories. Stories are our the, the sort of uh, Scrum, uh, but not just Scrum, uh, way to uh, get at tasks. Um, how many of you have heard of user stories? Okay. And how many of you have heard of requirements in this context? 
Okay, so requirements are basically, this is what the thing needs to do. It's not a task, the task would be do it uh, and, and break down, make it happen into a bunch of component steps. But the story, the, the requirement is this needs to be done. And user story is a way to uh, describe that in a, in a sort of formulaic way that's a little stiff and woody sounding, but it, it really works, uh, we find. Um, the danger with this is that you can get a little too down in the weeds and lose the forest for the trees to mix a million of metaphors. But um, <laughs> but here's the but but it's really good for if you can tightly scope a piece of work. It's really good for like getting good results. So here's the formula: as a somebody, I want blank because blank. So as a site visitor, or it could be as a donor, or an administrator, or an editor, or an author, somebody specific, a different type of user role, okay? As a site visitor, I can see popular locations in a navigation menu in the header of any page, okay? Um, so basically, I wanna see a nav, a nav menu with, with some of the high level pages, um, so that I can navigate to the most important areas of the site quickly. Um, now that third piece in this particular case is not a great example to illustrate why this is not redundant, but actually really important. So I'm gonna back up a step and show you a different task that is a little bit better. Um, and that's this one. As a potential donor, I can click a donate button in the header so that I can navigate to where I can give financial support online as easily as possible. In this particular case, the third clause of this user story by establishing the why, it's like providing the spirit of the law and making it more explicit rather than just the letter of the law. Without that, there are a surprisingly amazing number of ways that people could come up to, to uh, identify that they could meet this requirement if tasked with developing it. Maybe, okay, a donate button, there's a donate button, it goes to a page and the page has an address where people can mail checks to send money in. Well, yeah, that meets this requirement. That's that's an interpretation of this requirement. It's not really what we meant. So, the the why explains and provides context for people who are actually going to be completing the tasks. I'm going to go back to the first example and uh, show you more. Dive further into this. So that's that's the story. Here's some a bunch of detail in terms of this is an ongoing list of what this particular menu is going to have in it. And then we get into, uh, let's see, I'm dancing over a lot of stuff here that's Asana user interface stuff that's not important. So what's important here is these acceptance criteria next. So here's a bunch of things that are little extra addendums that define what uh, done looks like acceptably for this task. So it has to be responsive. It needs to have hover effects. It needs to uh, use neat breakpoints. That's a particular uh, CSS uh, SAS framework we're using on this project. Um, we need to have, like here's what happens with the rollover on the hover, um, and so on. And then we get down here from, oh, and also here's, here's something we just noted, like this would seem to be a natural piece, exact design for search input is TBD and out of scope, so we're explicitly saying don't worry about scope, that's a separate, uh, search, that's a separate task. Then we get into this log of tasks. These are the actual series of things in chronological order we did them in order to complete this. And you can see that a lot of different things happen from a handful of different people. There's a handful of QA tasks. There's some you know, fairly mundane things like push it up to a particular instance for QA. Um, hey, like I need help styling this one thing. You can see myself, Catherine, and uh, Alex, the last speaker, assigned to, to different tasks as this sort of uh, proceeds to, to finish this up. So um, this is just a... There's, there's actually a lot more to how we use Asana, but this, this is just gives you an idea about how we chunk up the work um, and, and how we try to bring a lot of um, focus to a, a very massive project, one tiny little piece at a time. Um, talked about Scrum already. The idea is get the entire team focused on one thing. Uh, the, the team succeeds or, win or, or fails together. Um, it creates uh, incentives for people to work together to uh, harness their creativity um, and not be sort of siloed, letting somebody else worry about something um, because it's their specialty. <clears throat> this is the roadmap for, for phase 1B and just to illustrate that there's some st still some things we're working on. In particular, the blog. Uh, is, was something that we needed to hit this July 31st deadline, so the blog got cut. That's something that we're going to be launching in the next couple of weeks. 
So I think that there are two orientations human beings have to deadlines. Some people thrive with them and some are allergic to them. And by orientation, I mean like who you're attracted to or like the things you're allergic to. I think it's kind of the same thing. Um, time isn't real for me. I can spend five minutes or five hours on something and if I'm in the zone, I, I really have no idea what's going on. Um, there are people that are better at deadlines. We're trying to get me out of the team's way and put people that are good at deadlines in place um, so that we can be more successful. Um, but I wanted to say that from a team's perspective, when you're in a scrum team and you're focused on creating, deadlines can and, and usually do feel pretty arbitrary. They're imposed by some sort of external uh, reason that, that doesn't, it's completely disconnected from the actual work you're doing. Um, the work will get done when it gets done is, is one approach to time and task management. Um, so the art to, to dealing with deadlines is to either not make them more than a couple of weeks in advance um, so that you can project based on your actual scrum momentum uh, how far you're doing or to set far out deadlines and expect to miss them, expect them to be lies and, and accept that people are going to need those. And I'm actually learning that this is something that you can negotiate. So sure, we'll give you a date, but I am going to tell you in the same breath a whole bunch of caveats and, and we're, we're setting a deadline, but really what we mean is a target date. And people like to use the word deadline, but things will change, it will get pushed out, something will get added, something will get taken out and so on. Um, another, another way on the side of the, the other orientation to time and, and deadlines is that uh, Parkinson's law, which Tim Ferriss has helped popularize, which is uh, work uh, expands to fill the time allotted to, to complete it. So deadlines are useful, don't get me wrong, because they, they do kind of focus down, but I think many incremental small deadlines is a lot better than some sort of July 31, three months from now this must be done. Um, now, to speak to George Takei's concerns about me being a PM and a developer, and oh, by the way, also the owner of this company, um, Amanda Blum, I love her, she's profane, she gave a talk in Seattle in February and she said, ask an engineer to make you a donut, he'll say, great, I'm gonna, uh, I, need, I want a donut tomorrow, great, two weeks from now I'm gonna give you a donut factory, it's gonna make all the donuts of all the varieties you ever want. She's like, no, just give me a fucking donut tomorrow, that's what I want. Um, so, as a builder, you're trying to make it great. So there's that incentive. Uh, and as a project manager, you're doing exactly the opposite. You're trying to keep things um, limited and trying to keep people happy. And um, sometimes uh, the, the developer's instinct or the builder's instinct to do something better sort of just means more complicated inevitably, and that actually tips the scale over into actually it's worse, it's not better. Because we've just sort of blown it, there's no way this is gonna work, it's gonna be difficult to maintain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And my third role, CEOs who are leading sales teams, their incentive is just to bring in as much work. So you've got developers who wanna make hay of the work we already have, you've got the CEO who wants to bring in more work despite the work we already have, and then you've got the PM who's my weakness, and so that interest just gets trampled. So we overcommit because I'm an overcommitter. Um, so that's a that's something that we're we're dealing with. Um, and by firing me as a PM, and it's great, and I've, I'm loving it. Um, it's weird for me to to think that I'm actually a better developer than I am a PM because that's exactly the opposite of what I've thought for years. Um, but it's liberating to realize that. And and I'm telling you this. I've told the client this. Uh, this is something to sort of be real about. We're going to make mistakes, and let's let's like be honest about why, and this is why, so I'm gonna tell the client, and that's gonna allow us to continue to work together because they see that we're getting better when we make mistakes. <coughs> I am gonna go over time, um, so let's see, I think I'm gonna cut this, and I'm gonna skip to everything I don't have time for. I was gonna just go through a whole bunch of bullets, but, um, so what happened on July 31st was, <coughs> remember that ISP host that I told you about? We had this really super cool Nginx reverse proxy setup that we were going to point to, and it was going to say, okay, internet traffic, I, I hear you, I'm receiving your, your request. Depending on whether this is an old site location or a new site location, I'm gonna send you to the server that hosts the old site or the new site. The old site server was this old ISP. All of a sudden, it went from having 
all of the traffic from all of the IP addresses that were accessing that server to all of the traffic from a single IP address, which was our proxy server. And it tripped some really quite sane fail safes and knocked it over. Now, we knew that there was a good possibility this might happen. This particular ISP's like three top level people were on vacation for like two weeks before this launch and we could not get the people on the phone. And so we actually had a um, five contingencies in place, um, which, because we thought something like this might happen and we just couldn't rule out these possibilities. And so this is what I want to, I want to speak to the importance of, uh, I have a whole bunch of slides I'm not going to get to, which is a bummer about the importance of empowering the team and why we did the whole countdown thing is kind of representative of that. But what it boils down to is um, enabling uh, creative, skilled people to anticipate problems and creatively solve them and, and, and go through that countdown where people are saying, yes, I believe we're ready. That can mean, I believe we're, actually I think this kind of thing might happen, but we're ready to deal with it if it does. Um, and so we did, and so we actually went through all five contingencies and they didn't work. So we, uh, we improvised that night. It was about 2 a.m. Pacific time on August 1st. This organization has an annual conference where they're delegates. They have a, roughly 50 affiliate organizations, roughly mapped to states in the U.S., uh, that send their delegates and they, they vote on rules changes, the most arcane specific rules changes to how chess tournaments are a run. It's amazing how much time goes into this. Uh, and uh, they have uh, hundreds of players coming to the US Open tournament, same event. Uh, the board has basically said, this is when you said the website would be done, so it better be, better be ready. The executive director's keynote speech is almost entirely about this great new website that, that you can load now. So it's 2 a.m. Pacific time. We've got people on the call there in Tennessee. It's 4 a.m. for them. Um, and, and we were able to fix it, and basically by jury rigging the situation where we just flipped the switch, so now internet traffic goes to the old server, and there's a whole lot of rewrite, uh, redirect rules on the Joomla side, pointing to WordPress if necessary, and on the WordPress side, pointing to Joomla if necessary. And um, so, and, and technically, this is kind of interesting, I guess, at this point, uh, this sort of high-level overview, uh, we, went from having uschess.org to this new .uschess.org subdomain, so a little technical footnote, uh, which is sort of what makes that possible. So that's all I have time for, sadly. I think I probably could talk for three times as long about this, but um, anyway, thank you very much.